and you should be getting a prompt right now. Okay, so without further ado, welcome to season two of the Hippocampal Subfields Group webinar series. We are so excited to have people coming back this year. Uh, we have a great lineup, including today's, um, and we, we hope that all of you keep coming back because we love the community that grew out of the last webinar series not only the new people who joined us, but hopefully it felt for those who were already a part of the group that it gave you another touch point in these times where everything is still pretty much remote. Um, we are going to be having these monthly, except for in, uh, I think May, we have two of them. Uh, and we'll show you the schedule at the end of today's webinar. And we're also gonna have it updated on the website at some point in the near future. So I'm Kelsey, I'm a postdoc at Wayne State. If you don't know me before, I am one of the co-hosts and I'm going to turn it over to Ravan so he can introduce himself and our wonderful speakers for the day. Hi, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, my name is Ravan de Flores. I'm a postdoc uh, in Caen, France. And I am extremely happy to introduce our very first speaker for this year, who is Dr. Valerie Carr. So Dr. Carr, her, her PhD in neuroscience from UCLA and completed a postdoc at Stanford, where she used high resolution structural and functional MRI to investigate neural, neural mechanisms of memory and how these mechanisms change with age. So she is currently an associate professor and associate chair of psychology at San Jose State University, where she leverages her knowledge uh, uh, to examine how factors like fitness and technology influence memory across the lifespan. So she was one of the original founders of the HSG uh, and currently serves as co-chair of the steering committee and chair of the questionnaire working group. So today she will be talking about uh, the HSG mission approach and uh, progress to date. So I'll read the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. All right, um, so first let me just say many, many thanks to Kelsey and Roban for putting this seminar series together for a second year in a row. Super appreciative of all the hard work that you've put into it. Um, so as Roban said, I'm gonna be talking about the motivation for creating our group, the approach that we've been taking and the progress we've made to date. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Laura, who's going to tell you about kind of what we're doing currently and then what we plan to do in the future. Okay, so I think this slide will be a surprise to absolutely no one, given that we all have interest in the medial temporal lobe, uh, but of course the MTL is critical for a variety of cognitive processes. So obviously memory, but also things like navigation and perception, but the MTL is not a unitary structure. It's composed of many different subfields. So we have the hippocampus and extra hippocampal regions, but then within the hippocampus itself, we can further break it down into subfields. So we have our CA1, CA2, CA3, dentate gyrus and subiculum. And then in terms of extra parapocampal regions, we have anal-rhinal, perirhinal, and parapocampal cortices. So it's a complex structure. And in addition to you know, anatomical and cognitivity differences with each of these subfields, there's also a lot of interesting data coming from the animal literature, from the human postmortem literature, suggesting that these subfields are differentially affected by things like age. So that could be both on the childhood development side as well as the older adult side, differentially affected by disease. So for example, Alzheimer's disease or temporal lobe epilepsy. And also that these regions are sensitive to interventions. So things like aerobic exercise, and so as you can imagine, this has generated a lot of interest in measuring the structure and function of subfields in vivo. So the most common way of measuring these subfields in vivo is MRI. 
And so I wanted to show you quickly, th these data come from PubMed, basically how crazy <laughs> this exponential increase in interest in MRI and hippocampal subfields has been over the past 20 years. Um, so what we have on the x-axis is just a plot of time starting in 2000 and then moving up to today. And then on the y-axis is just a count of number of publications. So the search I did was simply MRI and hippocampal subfields. And you can see a really exponential increase. And of course the bar for 2020 is very small so far, but I expect it to go up. So this is fantastic. There is a lot of interest in this field and I think rightly so. But this interest does not come without challenges. And so one of the main challenges is that if you look across all the different labs conducting this type of research, what you start to realize is that there are many, many different protocols for manually segmenting the hippocampus into subfields. So de deciding where those boundaries are between the different subfields. And so there are many differences across these protocols. So one example is the protocols are based upon different histological and anatomical references. They use different terminology. Uh, the protocols use different scanner strengths. So some might use 3T, some might use 7T. They use different image types. So it could be T1, T2, proton density. And then I think the biggest problem of all is they have different boundary locations. And so the main challenge here is that across protocols, there's so many differences that it really hinders our ability to draw conclusions from, you know, to make comparisons across studies, across labs, and then to draw really robust conclusions. So it could be that what I'm calling CA1, someone else is calling subiculum, but really we're talking about the same real estate within the hippocampus. So that makes it really, really difficult. So just to give you uh, some examples of this. So one of the first papers that our group published, and this is a paper uh, led by Paul Yushkovich in 2015, was we asked about 20 different labs to tell us a bit about their protocol. And then also we gave everybody the same brain and asked them to apply their segmentation protocol to that brain. First, what you can see, each row is just a different lab. And then you can see what histology or anatomical references each protocol uses. And you can see there's a lot of variability here. You know, one of the most popular, of course, is the uh, Duvernois Atlas, but there's many, many differences. And as you can imagine, if folks are using different histological and anatomical references, they might come to different conclusions about how to create their protocol. And then here, again, each row is a different protocol. And you can see the imaging modality in this column. So some folks use 3T, some use 7T, some folks use T1 weighted images, some folks use T2. And then here, what you see is the different terminology that people use. And I know there's a lot on this slide and I definitely wanna point you to Paul's paper if you wanna read more. But something that is that we found very interesting is that some people are splitters. So they will separately segment, for example, CA1, CA2, CA3, whereas other people might combine CA1, CA2, and CA3. And you can see there's just many, many differences across just the terminology being used. But I think this was the most eye-opening. So we compared again, this is about 20 labs. We gave everybody the same brain and we gave them the brain and the modality that they're used to using their protocol on. So some folks were using T1, T2, some folks were using 7T, but it's the same brain. And we asked everybody, just go ahead and apply the protocol that you normally use and let's take a look. So this is just one slice of the hippocampus. This is a coronal slice. And again, I know there's a lot going on here, but I just want to draw your attention to the wild differences and where the subiculum CA1 boundary is. So for some protocols, uh, like let's say this one here, the boundary between subiculum and CA1 is quite medial. So I apologize for anyone who's red, green, colorblind, but I'm trying to indicate with my mouse here 
where that boundary is. So for some folks, that's quite medial. And you can see that's the case here, for example. For other groups, it's more lateral. For example, for this group or this group. And that's just one boundary. There are many, many differences across groups and how these boundaries are drawn. And this, uh, this image is courtesy of Laura, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit. But this is really showing you the, the challenge that arises when folks have different boundaries. So what she did was she found studies that were looking at the relationship between aging and subfield volume. And so the, the yellow images are from T2 or proton density weighted uh, studies, and then the red are from T1 studies. But regardless, they're all essentially asking the same question, uh, which subfields show a relationship between volume and age. And so I'm, I'm just highlighting two. So I'll, I'll pick on a couple of our HSG members. So uh, in this study here, the authors drew the conclusion that the subiculum shows a strong relationship between age and volume. Um, and in this study, it was CA1, as well as you can see some dentate gyrus here. But if you look closely, there's actually a lot of overlap here between what this study is calling subiculum and what this study is calling CA1. So as I said, it, it's often the same real estate, it's just people are giving different labels. And so that makes comparisons across studies and the ability to draw conclusions really challenging. So that's just setting us up for why did we create the hippocampal subfields group? So we wanted to form an international group of researchers, all of whom are interested in human hippocampal subfields to develop a harmonized protocol, meaning one that's used across many, many different research groups from manually segmenting the hippocampal subfields on MRI. And so importantly, we want this protocol to be validated, right? We want it to be based on histology. We want it to be reliable, and we want it to be applicable to different age group, different populations, different health status, right? We don't just want this to be for healthy young adults. So you can see here a map uh, that indicates where hippocampal subfield members are located. And I did just take a look uh, before this talk. We are currently up to about 250 members across 20 different countries. So it's become quite a large group over the years. And I do wanna make it clear, if you've joined the webinar today or if you're watching this webinar, the group is always open. It is open to anyone. You can join at any time and you can find information about how to join on our webpage. And so we have a website, a hippocampal subfields group website. We also have a Twitter feed, and then we have a YouTube channel where the webinars are posted and you can find all of last season's webinars as well. You can also read several papers that we've put out over the years. I also mentioned um, one of these, but we have a couple more. And you're already here for our 2022 webinar series, but I do encourage you to continue attending throughout the spring. So one question that I get a lot when I've been presenting at conferences is, your group is focused on manual segmentation of MTL subfields, but for many of us, we're doing large scale studies where manual segmentation just, it's just not feasible automatic segmentation is much more desirable. And the thing that I think we need to remember is that automated approaches are ultimately based on some manual segmentation protocol, right? They've, they've gotta be trained on something. And so if you have differences in the underlying protocols that are driving those automated protocols, the same problem exists. We're still going to have variability in how those boundaries are defined. So I think it's really important to nail this down with a manual segmentation approach to start with. So I mentioned we have a total of about 250 members, but we do have some underlying structure to our group. And so I quickly wanted to walk through that. Um, so at the center here, you'll see a core committee and there are 12 of us, and I'm not gonna list every single one by name, but you can find us all on our website. So there's a core committee. 
And then we are divided into several different working groups. And so I will start with the acquisition methods working group. And I know these names are tiny, but I wanna make sure that we give everybody um, credit for their hard work. So this group put together a page on our website with recommendations about how to collect high resolution data that gives you good images of hippocampal and extra hippocampal subregions. Um, yeah, so that's essentially the, the aim of that group. Then we have the boundary working group, and this one is a doozy. There are then within that working group, many sub working groups. And each of these sub working groups is really focusing on a different part of the medial temporal lobe. So for example, we have a group focusing on segmenting the head, segmenting the tail. We have a histology group. So these are our neuroanatomists. And then within the hippocampal body itself, we have a group that focused on where does the hippocampal body start and stop, start and stop with respect to anterior posterior. The outer boundaries of the hippocampal body. So this is going to be things like your superior, inferior, and medial lateral boundaries. And then what we'll be focusing on today, what I think most folks care about is the inner boundaries. So for example, the boundary between CA1 and CA2. And once again, you can see many, many different names here. So many folks to thank for their hard work on these efforts. And then we have the questionnaire working group. And so this is the group of folks that puts together the questionnaire that you've been seeing in your inbox recently. Also over the years, we have had a number of different meetings. Some of these meetings are, are broad, meant for the entire HSG community. Other meetings are smaller and working group specific. Um, but I'm not gonna run through every single one of these, but we have been working hard for many years. And I don't have 2022 on here yet, but of course we have the 2022 webinar series ongoing. All right, so next I wanna talk about, now that we have a little bit of the history, the structure, the mission, I wanna talk a little bit about our approach. So again, our aim is to develop this harmonized protocol, but how are we gonna get there? So as I said, we want this to be a validated protocol. So what we start with is collecting histology data and working with neuroanatomists to label that data for us. And then we use that to inform the protocol that we are developing. So based on this histology, then we develop rules for MRI. So where are those subfield boundaries on MRI? Once we develop that protocol, we train a couple of folks on the protocol ask them to test it out. And in fact, some of our testers I saw are, are joined the meeting today, so I wanna give them thanks. So they do what we call an initial feasibility check. Test this out, let us know what you think. Let's do some you know, small scale reliability analysis. Assuming that looks good, then we put the protocol out to the larger hippocampal subfields group and we seek feedback. So we say, here's what we've come up with. What do you folks think? Do you agree with what we've done? Do you have suggestions for how we could revise it? And if there's not a lot of agreement, well, then we come back and we revise the process. So based on the feedback that we get and the suggestions that we receive, we can revise the protocol, do another feasibility check, and then once again, ask the wider community, okay, now what do you think? And that process just continues until we hone in on agreement for these boundaries. Once we do reach agreement on the boundaries, then we would move on to a much larger scale and formal reliability process. So those are the general steps that are used, but we have broken this down into different parts of the medial temporal lobe. So we started kind of with the low hanging fruit. We started with the hippocampal body because the anatomy is a little more simple than it is in the head and the tail. And so we even started first with just looking at the outer boundaries of the hippocampal body. As I said, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, and medial lateral. So 
we collected uh, labeled histology, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment, from our neuroanatomist. And then we use that to create an outer boundaries protocol. We did a feasibility check and we collected data from the larger group. Thankfully, because that those boundaries are, are relatively straightforward, um, we had agreement after our first pass. So we did not have to come back and repeat this process. But before we can move on to our formal reliability process, um, we of course wanna get the inner boundaries of the hippocampal body as well. So once again, this is driven by our labeled histology. We developed a protocol for the inner boundaries. And here, I really wanna thank the inner boundaries, uh, boundary working group, that was a lot of work. Um, trained a couple folks on this protocol. I also wanna make sure that we thank them for being our guinea pigs and giving us feedback. And then uh, just these past few months, we sent out a questionnaire to the broader HSG community saying, okay, this is what we've come up with for the inner boundaries. Please let us know what you think. So are you in agreement? What can be improved and so forth. And I am at the end of my talk gonna tell you, give you a little sneak peek of what we've been hearing. Now, Laura, who's gonna be speaking after me is going to go into more detail about the head and the tail. But we do have labeled histology for the head and uh, we have developed an initial protocol for the hippocampal head and the, the rest of the steps are pending. Again, Laura is gonna say a little bit more about that. And then for the tail, um, we actually decided not to collect labeled histology, but we have developed a, a protocol. And once again, I'm gonna wait for Laura to speak about the head and the tail. What I'm gonna focus on today is the body. And so I'm just gonna walk through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So first step is collecting labeled histology. And so I very much wanna thank our neuroanatomists. I know at least one of whom has joined today. So we have multiple neuroanatomists working with us and we have multiple histology samples. So for the body, we had uh, three samples. For the head, we have four samples. And each of these samples is labeled by at least two, most often three neuroanatomists. So they provide us the histological data, they label, they put all the subfield boundaries for us, and then they work with us. They've attended various meetings and workshops to then help us develop our protocols. So help us apply what they've done with histology to MRI. So many, many thanks to all of our neuroanatomists. Here's an example of uh, some histological data, labeled data that we collected from neuroanatomists. And so this is a sample slice. This is a coronal slice of the hippocampal body. And as you can see, it's been labeled by three different folks. And then we can use this super helpful data as we develop our protocol. Okay, so about the segmentation protocol process. So as I said, we really use that histological data to guide us and develop a draft protocol. And here, what I'm gonna be focusing on is the inner boundaries. So for example, the boundary between CA1, CA2, CA2, CA3, and so forth. So of course, the images that we get on MRI are not as beautiful as those histological samples. So we have to make some compromises and we have to try to approximate the histology. So we do that by using things like MRI image contrast, anatomical landmarks that are easy to see on MRI, but also we have to develop some geometric rules. And I'll give you some examples of those in a moment. So our draft protocol for the inner boundaries of the hippocampus, we have rules for segmenting subiculum from CA1, CA1 from CA2, CA2 from CA3, and CA3 from dentate gyrus. And for those of you that have already filled out the questionnaire, uh, many thanks. And what I'm gonna say is not a surprise to you. So additionally, for the CA3 DG boundary, we are exploring or evaluating two different options. And so this is one of the main things that we were excited to hear from people for the questionnaire. So the two options for this particular boundary, one we're calling the geometric rule. 
This is a little bit more simple. It's easy to understand. Our initial feasibility testing shows that it is more reliable. Um, however, it may be less valid. It may be less of a close match with the histology. So then we developed a second possible rule, which we're calling the infolio rule. It is more complex for those of you that have filled out the questionnaire. You got to see this in detail. Um, our initial feasibility testing shows it's a bit less reliable, probably due to that complexity, but it may be more valid. It may be a more close fit for the histology. So we are really curious to hear from folks what they thought about these trade-offs. So first, I want to walk you through the geometric rule. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because my hope is that you filled out the questionnaire. You have read our extensive documentation of this protocol. But essentially, as I mentioned, we're using things like MRI contrast, really obvious anatomical landmarks, and then we are using some geometric rules. And so I'm not going to go in a lot of detail here but you can see a nice schematic up top and you can understand why we're calling this a geometric rule because we're drawing straight lines, we're making angles, very geometric rules. And so you can see it here applied to a sample coronal slice of the hippocampal body. And then overlaid, we have how you would actually segment these different subfields according to this rule. Now, what we found is that the Dentate, the, the dentate gyrus here, which is in light blue, and the CA3 weren't as close of a match to the histology as we would have liked. For example, some of the CA3 could be better labeled as dentate gyrus. So we thought about another rule. Now for this other rule, the boundaries between subiculum CA1 stays the same. CA1, CA2 stays the same. CA2, CA3 stays the same. The only thing that differs for the rule that I'm gonna describe is the CA3 dentate gyrus boundary. Otherwise, everything else is the same. So this we're calling the infolio rule because it approximates the infolio fiber pathway. And so once again, I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail about how this is set up. You can read all about it in our supplemental documentation. But I think even just by looking at the schematic and looking at the uh, overview here, it's obvious that this is a more complex rule. And that comes with, with a cost of potentially being less reliable. But if we look here, you can see again, dentate gyrus in light blue, CA3 in yellow. This seems to better approximate the histological data. So it, more be, it may be more valid. So that leads us to the initial feasibility check. So we had two raters who were very experienced with manual segmentation, but they had never used this particular protocol. And so we asked them to try it out. So we, we provided them with a lot of training so they could become comfortable with the protocol. And then they segmented six brains of varying age, disease, image quality. And then we were able to assess inter-rater reliability. And so um, ICC was one of the measures we did. This essentially is consistency and volume measurements. And then DICE essentially tells you about the amount of overlap uh, of the voxels of that particular subfield. And so let's look first at ICC. Um, you'll notice that uh, the values for the subiculum are quite low. It turns out this is not because the raters misunderstood how to draw the boundary between subiculum and CA1. Rather, we realized we did a bad job of training them how to segment subiculum from the cortex. So <laughs> that's, that's why this number is quite low. Um, but you see the ICC values are quite high um, for most all subregions, with the exception of CA3 as defined using the endfolio rule. And then same thing for DICE, you can see that these are, are mostly pretty high, not as high for CA2, this is a very small subfield, and also not as high for CA3 as defined by the infolio rule. And so what this tells us, at least when we're considering the geometric and the infolio rules, is that there does seem to be less reliability 
for the infolial rule, again, likely owing to its complexity. So now that we have this protocol developed, we've done this initial feasibility testing, we decided it's time to get feedback from the larger community. And I wanna pause here to give Anna Doherty and her team a thousand thanks. For those that have filled out the questionnaire, you have seen the, the sheer amount of data and materials that she produced. So she wrote up all the verbal descriptions of the subfield boundaries. Um, she put together a kind of in a nice format, the histological data, all of the sample MRI images. She worked on gathering up the initial feasibility test. She wrote a 70 plus page supplemental document. She provided sample data sets and she made extensive training videos. Um, so again, a thousand thanks to Anna and her team for their hard work. Um, as a member of the questionnaire working group, I comparatively had it much easier. I just had to take all that fantastic material and copy paste it into a questionnaire. So the questionnaire um, for each of the subfield boundaries that the protocol includes. So for example, the boundary between CA1 and CA2. We asked folks, how clear is the description of this boundary? Um, how clear are the images that we've provided? We also asked people, the level of agreement. And this is just a Likert scale from one to nine, um, the level of agreement with each boundary. And then, as I mentioned, we have these two versions of the CA3 dentate boundary. And so we asked people, do you have a preference for one of these over the other? And then for all of the boundaries, let's say they don't agree, what suggestions do they have? And so uh, that is something that we just sent out in December. And so far we have received uh, responses from 22 labs. We did give a couple labs uh, an extension. So we're hoping to get data from a couple more labs. And I just wanna pause here and say for anybody that is watching this webinar or, or is gonna watch the recording in the future, if you want to fill out this questionnaire, but maybe you did not know that existed, so if you're someone that has manual segmentation expertise and you want to weigh in and give us your opinion, please, please reach out. We would love to add your data and it's not too late. So we can, we can give you a bit of an extension and we would love to hear from you. But so far we have feedback from 22 labs and I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what we heard from these labs. However, I don't want to give all the data yet because we still have a couple labs that, that haven't submitted their data. So all of the boundary descriptions were rated as extremely clear. So on a scale from one to nine, they were all at least 8.4 or above out of nine. Um, so again, a thousand thanks to Anna for writing such fantastic material. Um, the one that was rated lower was the CA3DG in folio pathway or boundary rather. And so folks just found that one to be a little bit more confusing, a little bit less clear. And that wasn't really a surprise to us. We figured that would be the case going in. So that's just how clear did people think the descriptions were. But we also asked folks, do you agree with these boundaries? And what we were really excited to learn is that there was high levels of agreement with all boundary rules. And so essentially the way that we assess, does someone agree with this rule or not? is on a scale of one to nine, did they give a rating above five, indicating pretty strong agreement. So for all of the rules that we proposed, we had more than two thirds agreement, so upwards of 68%. However, the, the boundaries with the lowest agreement, again, it's still high, but the ones with the lowest agreement was the CA1, CA2 boundary. So that was 73% agreement and then the CA3DG geometric boundary. So the CA1, CA2 boundary, I think was a little more controversial um, because many folks don't typically segment uh, these, this boundary. They don't typically separate those two. So I think some people didn't feel quite as certain about this. And then for the CA3DG rule, the geometric rule, interestingly, this one seemed to be pretty polarizing. 
a small number of people felt that it really didn't capture, it really wasn't very valid. Um, whereas a lot of people felt that it was straightforward and worth the trade-offs. So that one was a little bit polarizing. And then lastly, we asked people, okay, given what you've seen about these two options for DGCA3, um, which do you prefer? And there was a strong preference for the geometric rule, um, about two to one preference. So what's interesting is that even though there wasn't super high agreement for this rule, as I said, it was kind of uh, polarized. There were a few people that very much didn't like it, but the majority of people did like it. So that's where we are right now. Of course, we are waiting for additional feedback. If you want to provide additional feedback, we would love to hear from you. Just reach out and let us know. And that's it for me. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura, who's going to talk about current directions and next steps. Um, so I just want to thank you. And as I said, um, please, please reach out if you in particular want to complete the questionnaire and you haven't yet. You can find my email address here, and you can also find all of our contact information on the website. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Valerie. Um, Laura, I can introduce you uh, very briefly, and it's a real pleasure to introduce you um, as a second speaker and, and the last one for today. So um, Dr. Visse earned her PhD in neuroscience from Duparc University in the Netherlands and completed a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. So she's currently an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Diagnostic Radiology at Lund University, Sweden. And her main interests are imaging of the medial temporal lobe, imaging and diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and major depressive disorder. Uh, she is involved in the development of new tools for assessing medial temporal lobe structures, but she is also interested in investigating how these medial temporal lobe structures relate to aging, disease, and cognitive functions such as memory. And yeah, today she'll be talking about the HSG current and future. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. I'm very excited to talk about our current and future efforts. So uh, I will start with our current efforts. And as Valerie already mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the hippocampal tail and protocol development, and also about the hippocampal head protocol development. So uh, to show you again, our little scheme on the left with our approach, uh, and then specifically for the hippocampal tail, uh, we have actually not collected histology data, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, the group has uh, developed a protocol for the outer boundaries and is currently working on starting up the feasibility check. So that's very nicely moving along. So why uh, is there no histology data or no subfield protocol for the TIL at this moment? Uh, so I wanna talk about that briefly. So there's actually um, quite large variability in appearance of the hippocampal tail. And uh, many of you who are segmenting have probably noticed this as well. And this comes from a post-mortem study that I did together with Roba and David Perron. And uh, we actually found that there could potentially be uh, two variants of the hippocampal tail. They're shown in these two rows. So on the top row, you probably have a little bit more of a body-like shape of the tail all the way to the end. So you see the subiculum inferiorly, then CA1 at the lateral border, CA2, 3, that kind of curves back inward into the dente gyrus. Whereas some other hippocampal tail uh, look uh, a bit different where uh, 
at some point on the medial end, there's CA2 and 3 coming in, which then merges with the lateral CA2 and 3, and then the dentate gyrus appears, and you often only see CA1. And interestingly, what we found is that this variability is likely dependent on the tail curvature. So there's actually quite some variation in curvature, with some people having a tail curvature in the medial direction, as you can see on the upper left corner of this figure, and some have it more in the superior or inferior direction, as you can see in the lower right of this corner, a uh, lower right corner of this figure. So, um, and actually what we found is that this body-like shape appears more when re-slicing uh, the till perpendicular to, to the curvature. So it actually seems that this variability is likely due to the curvature of the till. So you can see that in this figure that if you, uh, on the top row, slice it in the coronal plane, you can see this kind of weird appearing till structures. But if you then slice it uh, perpendicular to the curvature, it actually looks much more like a body slice, as you can see in the lower part of this figure. So uh, that, of course, would make it a little bit more difficult to uh, develop a subfield protocol, maybe not impossible. Uh, but then combining that together with often limited contrast in these uh, T2-weighted high-resolution images, uh, which are quite anisotropic still, uh, you can see that there's not that much detail in the, um, in the MRI scan to really make out uh, any of the details that you would want to see to do subfield segmentation. And that's combined with the amount of variability made us think at this point that it's maybe not such a good idea to develop a subfield protocol. But we are probably going to, uh, we, we are going to put this into the questionnaire and post this to the HSG to see like we have these type of MRI scans, we have this variability in appearance. Do you think it's a good idea to develop a subfield protocol? Um, so that will be uh, forthcoming together with the outer boundaries protocol. So then I wanted to show you, uh, give you a sneak peek of the outer boundaries of the hippocampal tail. And uh, I think there's not really a huge surprise here. Hopefully these will not be too controversial. Um, so what I show here are the, the four different borders, inferior, lateral, medial, superior. And this has been developed uh, by the working group consisting of Robert de Flores, uh, Anne Maas, John Schein, and Nicole Gervais. Um, so then I wanted to have a quick talk about the head, hippocampal head protocol development. And here we actually did collect histology data and uh, also uh, are in the process of developing subfield boundaries uh, for the hippocampal head. And uh, just giving you a sneak peek at the histology data. And for those of you who have been visiting our uh, working group meetings, you've already seen this probably. So we have a beautiful data set included by, uh, which includes three samples uh, of the hippocampal head. And each sample uh, has 14 to 16 slices with a cap uh, between 0 0.8 and 1 millimeter. And they were all segmented by three neuroanatomists for which we of course are incredibly grateful. And below here, you can see uh, one example um, of one slice of one of the samples. Uh, and you can see the three different annotations. And I think you can see that there's actually quite some similarities, but also some uh, differences, which I guess keeps life exciting for us. <laughs> uh, and we've been using that histology data to develop a hippocampal head subfield protocol. And um, the working group as it is in its current form is uh, again posted on the left. So consisting of Robin de Flores, Trevor Steve and Marshall Dalton uh, with Renaud Lachois as liaison. Um, and I have to say that this uh, working group, unfortunately, underwent several member changes because unfortunately some people have left academia. So it's been a bit of a rough going, but hopefully we're now can move forward and uh, develop this protocol. And what you can see here in the figures on the left 
a example of a geometric rule uh, applied to the uh, histology slice on the left, and then the same rule applied to the MRI on the right. So then um, I want to end with some exciting uh, future things that are upcoming, and I will first discuss uh, a meeting in Lund that we're planning. So uh, yes, we are really hoping to have an in-person meeting in Lund uh, this June. Um, we were originally planning already to have it last year uh, because I was optimistically thinking the pandemic would have ended by then, but uh, we had to postpone. So I'm really, really hoping uh, this will happen this year and we just recently started planning. Um, and this will be a, a meeting that's very much focused on the parapocampal gyrus on histology. And what we hope to do in this meeting, again, with uh, the great help of different neuroanatomists who are kind enough to, to help us with this, is to harmonize terminology on sulci, macrostructure, and parapocampal subregions, but also to collect histology annotations for the different subregions and compare the differences as we have done before. And uh, I want to quickly mention Annika Wüstefeld and Hannah Baumeister, who are uh, helping with organizing this event. So we will uh, hopefully soon communicate and advertise this meeting. So stay tuned for that. And then uh, I think some other good news uh, is that we finally received funding for this effort. And uh, uh, we, we worked very hard on an R1 last um, year and uh, we already know knew since the summer that it got a very good score in the fourth percentile but uh perfect timing we received a notice of award last friday um and this is a um, grant that will be led by lei wang rosanna olsen and myself uh, but of course many other people are contributing to this among others of course renault lachois and anna doherty and of course valerie carr um, so this will fund um, going and future work and will hopefully expedite the harmonization efforts. And I wanted to quickly mention our specific aims. So of course, the first aim is to actually complete our work and harmonize, uh, the, develop a harmonized protocol for LMTL subregions. Then aim two and three are really focused on validation of this protocol. So in aim two, we aim to validate uh, the protocol in early stage AD through associations with markers of specific pathologies, and in this case, tau pathology and cardiovascular disease. And then AIM-3, we actually aim to evaluate the manual protocol in a very interesting disease population, semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia, um, which is so severely, they're so severely affected that automated segmentation is actually very difficult. And then in AIM-4, we aim to disseminate and promote the harmonized protocol. And we have recently started talking about uh, this work and we'll probably start with a best practices paper, which will likely focus, uh, focus on quality assessment. Uh, I think probably of MRI and automated segmentation. So uh, we might actually ask your input on that or if you have a lot of experience with this, uh, developed protocols in your lab on quality assessment, then you can also reach out to us and uh, maybe contribute to this paper. So also stay tuned for that. So those were uh, our exciting future plans. Uh, so if there are any questions, then I think Valerie and I are happy to take them. Thank you so much, Laura and Valerie, for those wonderfully paired talks. There's so much exciting stuff. Congrats, too, on finally getting the NOA. I know you've been, like, waiting for it for such a long time. Um, so, yes, I would like to open up. Uh, there's, I think, a few of us here now today where if you want to unmute and have a conversation and questions, we can do that. If you'd feel more comfortable using the chat box, feel free to use that as well. And I am just so disappointed I did not grab a screen grab of the little sunglasses at the campus that you just, just had up there because I was chatting Ravon how funny it was. Thank you. Yes, I need this. Thank you. It's so funny. I, I think I spent an afternoon during my PhD making this one. It was time well spent. It was <laughs> 
All right. These cr crickets. Um, I don't know that I have any specific questions about what you've, you've done out, but I guess the, the question I would have that maybe would be of interest to everyone is something that Valerie could answer. And that would be just because we got a sneak peek today, um, given the extensions, when do you think that people could anticipate maybe at the earliest, obviously not holding you to anything of disseminating those results more, more broadly? Yeah, very good question. So we've given folks an extension until the end of the month, which is only just a, a few more days at this point. Um, and I already have all the code written to analyze the data, so it should be pretty plug and play. So I would say, you know, realistically, by the time I put everything into nice, pretty format, uh, maybe mid-March. Awesome. So if there's a, if there's enough of it, time before the next webinar, maybe you'll be able to peek in and say, guys, update. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Um, I, I know no one asked, but I'll just put this out there, particularly for anyone that might be watching the recording. So if you're wondering, wow, there's a lot of working groups, how do I get involved? Uh, probably the easiest thing is just to send one of us an email. Um, we also have a, a general email that goes to our group um, and you can find all of that information on the website, but particularly as Laura just mentioned, we are gonna be doing a lot of upcoming work about the head or the tail or the extra hippocampal, extra hippocampal regions. Um, and so if, if any of those are of interest to you, definitely let us know. And then of course, there's always the questionnaire. If you haven't filled out the questionnaire yet, we would love your response. <laughs> so don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Valerie, um, it's Rosanna. <laughs> uh, I just, if nobody else has a question, maybe I can ask you, um, I don't think you said, you, you gave a wonderful presentation, but I don't think you said how we judge whether we've reached consensus or not. And I was just wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit about, I know you probably don't wanna give away yet of whether we're going to reach consensus the first round or not for the since we're still awaiting results but do you want to just say a little bit about how we are hoping to reach consensus if yeah yeah that's a fantastic question so for given subfield boundary um i don't know i keep using ca1 ca2 as an example so we ask people on a scale of one to nine how much do you agree so nine indicating more agreement and so essentially to determine have we reached consensus across, let's say the 22 labs that have filled this out? We do a binomial test, very simple. Is there more agreement than disagreement? And so on a scale of one to nine, we count agreement as over five. So six, seven, eight, or nine. And we count disagreement as under five, one, two, three, four. So essentially we count up how many labs disagree, how many labs agree. We do a binomial test. Are the, is there more agreement than disagreement? So pretty straightforward. And yes, I know so far <laughs> what we do and don't have agreement on, but I don't want to bias in case anybody uh, is watching that hasn't filled it out yet. Great. While we are seeing, or if anyone's percolating on any questions, I am just going to throw the schedule up for the, the rest of the season, um, which I'm very excited about. We kicked it off so strong today with a nice background and the progress, and especially with the NOA coming and the possible meeting, such exciting things on the horizon. Um, so that was today, February 23rd. And we will have next um, month innovative approaches for subfield segmentation. And that's gonna be with uh, Sarah Gannon and Ali Khan. And I am hoping that we see most of you there as well. And then we're gonna have um, Menno Witter talking about anorhinal cortex circuitry and animals, which should be a really fun session uh, to have some 
cross over into the animal domain since most of us here work in, in humans. It's so nice to have a really well given presentation about work in animals. And then we're going to have um, a, a two in May, we're gonna have Mark Shira and Steve Kassam talk about moving towards ultra high resolution subfield segmentation. And that includes some optimization of our MRI methods. Um, they reached out to the group and we were, were really excited to be able to incorporate the work that they're doing about creating an atlas for subfields and very high resolution imaging. Um, and then we're going to be doing some a talk uh, with Attila Kares and Elliot Johnson about hippocampal subfields and development, which I am extra excited about as a developmentalist. And then we're gonna end our series with a trainee session, which was so fantastic last time with the rising stars who are working on all things MTL related. And we do have these trainees confirmed. We just have to make sure that for one of the talks, if it's one or two people um, who will be tag teaming it, um, but the, the topic with there will be cognitive neuroscience and normal and pathological aging. So we've got, I think, a wonderful span of topics and we'll share this information uh, with you again. It's not just gonna be on this slide, but I wanted to preview it, all of this for you so that you know what is coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, so with that, Raban, do you have anything to add other than an amazing thank you for Laura and Valerie for kicking us off? Uh, I don't have anything to add. Just thank you very much, Laura and Valerie, and I hope we'll see you next month. Yes, we hope to see you. We hope to see you all soon on March 30th at, at this time, and you will see us on Twitter trying to come up with funny things like using Annie to, to, to advertise. Um, all right, well, with that, I'm going to close it out for today. We'll have this up on YouTube if you miss parts of it. I know people were trickling in and out. And yeah, we will see you all soon. Have a good one, everyone.